Hello, good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here for the last day of this Planeteers World Gathering. Right now, we are going to talk about consent and what does this mean to all of us, especially to girls and women. Before we start talking, we are going to watch a documentary, a short documentary about sexual concert inspired by the play Prima Facey by Susie Miller and the work being done by Schools Consent Project to re-educate about consent. It focuses on three phases of this global issue. What it is, the work being done by this project, and the impact art can have on communities. A hopeful message that change can happen if we work together for it. Let's look at it. A person consents if he or she makes a choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. If you don't have a no, that doesn't mean it's a yes. If you don't have a no, but someone looks uncomfortable or fearful or awkward, don't assume you have a yes, don't assume you have their consent. And so that's why we really encourage our young people to um, take a really holistic look at the situation, to try and read the body language and the facial expressions and the dynamic uh, before determining whether or not they have consent. For if there's any doubt at all, ask. And if there's still doubt, you stop. Consent is at the heart of having healthy and happy sexual relationships uh, and educating people about consent I think is the key to reducing the appalling um, level of sexual violence that we um, see at the moment. Sometimes sexual violence, sexual harassment is born out of ignorance, comes out of a lack of knowledge and if we can dispel some of the misinformation, quite a lot of the misinformation that's out there, the myths and stereotypes that are out there, that will help alleviate some of those problems. The idea for the school's consent project came from a conversation I had with a friend of mine who had been sexually assaulted by her boss at work. And I felt as though talking it through with her from a legal perspective, talking about things like what consent actually meant and what would happen in court and what that person might get by way of sentence, helped her reframe what had happened to her. Our workshop does touch on the law and it does touch on the legislation. And quite often we're looking at things like the sending of indecent images or the ages of consent or the legal definition of consent. And we certainly feel that the more in-depth legal material is better reserved uh, to young people aged 11 to 18 when they're really starting to encounter these sorts of uh, issues and topics for the first time. Often, and I see this in our workshops, when we are having these discussions, we're interacting with young people, we're encouraging them to speak openly, ask us questions and we ask them questions. What they are telling us through their questions, through their comments, is often that we didn't know that or we didn't understand that and that means that they don't know the right the wrong not just in terms of law but just in terms of making ethical decisions as well and education talking to them in really direct concrete terms giving them examples talking to them about everyday instances where they can use this information means that they can put two and two together and then they can accept and learn from that as well. The workshops teach young people about their rights and about their responsibility to others. So some of that is about what consent looks like, body language, obviously saying yes, yes or no, but the focus is often on trying to identify consent in um, your sexual partner. Um, so making sure that you check in with a person you might be intimate with to make sure that they're comfortable. It's a viewpoint that we often encounter when we go into schools and we speak to young people, that if you've consented to something once, uh, and if you're in a domestic relationship, a romantic relationship, an offence can't happen to you. You can't be sexually assaulted and you can't be raped. And one of the things that we try and do is get young people to understand that consent has to be given for each interchange. 
as an offshoot of the workshops we deliver, schools are often asking us to also speak to the parents of the children we're speaking to. So we might deliver a workshop to the students and then in the evening we will do a parent forum ostensibly to tell the parents what we've covered so that they can support those conversations at home. But often it's about educating the parents, educating the adults who are also passing on these messages. And it's a way in which that we can help it filter both ways. And in some of the workshops, I will sometimes say to young people, you know, you've, you've sat through our workshop, you now know, you now know and understand your rights and your responsibilities. You understand what the law says about these things. Go home and educate your adults. I love delivering the workshops. They are, um, we're obviously dealing with really serious and sensitive subject matter, but being able to go into a room and leave, you know, an hour later, having had open and honest conversations where you can see young minds changing is such a privilege. I think like most laws in our country, they are written um, by and in many ways for white men. I don't think that these laws often cater to the female experience. And one of the things that I enjoyed about the play Prima Facie is how that looked at the trauma of the female experience manifests itself in evidence, i.e. you might not be able to give a very linear, straightforward, clear account of a violation. It might come out messily, it might come out in spurts, you might misremember something, but you might focus in on the central violation. And I think a court system that is much more reflective of and responsive to how violence actually manifests itself, um, not exclusively, but particularly in women who are statistically more likely to be the victims of sexual harming, um, I, I think that would be a much more successful model and I think we'd see many more uh, convictions. The play Prima Facie was phenomenal on many levels in terms of the work we do. It really drew a wide range of audiences into thinking about issues which they probably wouldn't have necessarily thought of, certainly not in that context before. Um, the Schools Consent Project has been running these workshops in schools for seven years now, so we've been doing this work in that field for some time. But because of the play, it allowed people to start talking about the issues and thinking about how do we prevent, how do we do that? And my firm belief is education is the answer to those questions. Empathy and understanding are really going to be the seedbed of change. And what the play did, I think, so beautifully was engender empathy uh, and foster understanding. Um, I think that can only lead to positive change. The more people are thinking about issues to do with consent and the more people who are thinking about the problems that we have um, in the criminal justice system when it comes to serious sexual offences, literally just the more brains are put together in, in addressing these problems, um, hopefully um, the faster the change. And our young people are living their lives more and more, both online and offline, that is where they get their information from, unless we provide them with a better place to get that information. And if we're not talking to them, the adults, the trusted adults in their lives, whether it's teachers, whether it's us as educators going in and delivering a workshop, whether it's parents, because that's a really important role parents have to play too, they're going to seek it out from somewhere else. There's always more to learn. Um, you don't say, well, we've, we've given you basic maths. Uh, you're done now. But there's always more to talk about and more conversations to build on. Um, and I think it can go much further outside of school. I mean, a lot of the harmful ideas um, that have been passed down to younger generations about gender roles or uh, power dynamics in sex or um, and any harmful attitudes to sex, many have been passed down. And so even kind of older generations, I think, would benefit from um, more conversations about consent and what it is. The statistics on how frequent um, sexual violence is in romantic relationships, of course, those aren't confined to people under 18 or under 25. Those statistics are for, um, you know, people in romantic relationships throughout their life. So uh, clearly these are important conversations for everybody to be having.
we need to stop seeing consent as a tick box exercise and start seeing it as something that's an ongoing conversation. If we really want to see social change, we need to educate from the grassroots up um, because there, there's a lot out there. There's a lot, a lot of very important and worthwhile organisations out there, but the vast majority are a plaster over a wound. They're there to pick up the pieces when there's been a sexual assault or a rape. And whilst uh, they're incredibly important, they're essential services, uh, to lower uh, those, the, the number of those violations, to lower those conviction rates, what we need is preventative work. And people who, like us, go into schools and teach young people from an early age what sort of behaviour is OK, what sort of behaviour isn't OK, what consent means, what it looks and feels like. And I passionately believe that once we do that, we will see change at university level, in the workplace, perhaps even on juries and in their conviction results of tomorrow. As diferentes formas de violência e discriminação baseadas no género têm impactos terríveis nas economias, na saúde, nas famílias e, em primeiro lugar, na vida das vítimas, na sua maioria, mulheres de todas as idades e de todos os países. A violência sobre as meninas, as raparigas e as mulheres assenta em relações de poder desigual que são muitas vezes legitimadas à luz de tradições e cenários sociais que as aprisionam e matam com base em decisões que nunca são as suas. A violação, a mutilação genital feminina, os casamentos infantis e forçados, o abuso, o assédio e a violência sexual. Todos os dias nós contamos novas vítimas e todos os dias as vítimas são novamente violadas, novamente batidas e abusadas. Mostrar os rostos, as histórias e conhecer as estatísticas parece não ser suficiente para as políticas públicas e para os agressores. Os programas e os discursos não têm tido os resultados que precisávamos para mudar as realidades. A violência é particularmente relevante no contexto das relações de intimidade, no contexto de uma relação de namoro, de um casamento e até no seio familiar, porque, como sabemos, todo o tipo de violências acontece muitas vezes num círculo próximo e de pertença da vítima, como nos mostram os relatórios e o fantástico trabalho da Prima Face. Precisamos de ensinar desde muito cedo o que significa sim e não, escolha e decisão e, sobretudo, autonomia corporal. Precisamos de perceber que ouvir um não pode não significar não gosto de ti. Ouvir um não pode significar não estou pronta ou agora não, mas significa, sobretudo, eu não quero. Precisamos que nas escolas, no local de trabalho e nas famílias se ensine como se manifesta e como se constrói o consentimento nos requisitos para se entrar no novo emprego, incluindo nos serviços públicos, para se ser eleito ou eleita, deveria ser obrigatório, e repito, obrigatório, um curso sobre consentimento. Nas universidades, nos concursos para programas financiados, nas empresas, deveria ser requisito obrigatório um módulo sobre consentimento, tal como existe, por exemplo, nas Nações Unidas. É necessário que existam códigos de conduta, coerência e articulação entre serviços e políticas públicas. É urgente que se entenda que uma vítima nunca, mas nunca, é responsável por um ato de violência. Não se pode continuar a não respeitar o consentimento, a ouvir o silêncio das vítimas. Não se pode continuar a enumerar atenuantes e jurisprudência. Não é possível apatia em relação à violência sobre as meninas e as mulheres, incluindo em tempos de guerra, conflitos e crises humanitárias, onde a violência sexual é terreno fértil. Enquanto embaixadora de boa vontade do Fundo das Nações Unidas para a População e presidente da ONG de Corações com Croa, já testemunhei muitos desabafos de raparigas e mulheres que não sabiam que podiam dizer não, que tinham medo de dizer não. Não, é esta a palavra que importa reter. Não, o vosso não também. O consentimento não existe enquanto eu manifesto o meu não. Não é não. Ponto final. Yes, a big applause to this work. And now let's discuss it. This documentary, the school project, and the play. So I call to meet me here at the stage, Carolina Duarte, producer and director of this documentary, Mafalda Matias, human rights professional currently working at the 
NGO FEM, in Portuguese, Feministas em Ação, and Monica Bogal, that we saw here, director of the school's content project. Consent project, please meet me. So let's start by the beginning. What does consent mean? I want this to be a conversation, okay? So just not follow a specific order. Please contribute as you wish. Should I start then? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think consent essentially means that we all need to agree to things on a daily basis. It's mm -hmm. not just sex, everyday scenarios. It's everything, it's everything really. And I think, uh, especially after seeing the play Prima Facie, I realized that we all lack consent in one way or another, even if it's just the awareness of it. Because obviously I saw the play, I'm a woman, I've been catcalled, I've been groped. You know, all of those issues that probably all of us on stage <laughs> know very well. Um, and I thought that was normal. Society tells me that's normal. It's normal. Yeah, you were educated that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I saw the play, and then I was like, oh, that's not normal. And then I looked into it and realized, oh, maybe we need to stop and think and do something about it. And I came across SCP's work, mm -hmm. and that's how we are all here. Mafalda. Uh, so I think it would be relevant also uh, to get Monica's perspective because she comes, her background is in law, my background is in law, yeah. and unlike the UK, we don't have um, consent law. We just have um, specific crimes in our criminal code. And we also have been amending it to be more in line with uh, the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, uh, the Istanbul Convention. Still, uh, it is very important, I would like to say, of course, not only in our laws, but the Istanbul Convention is very progressive in that sense. It focuses sexual, sexual violence in the lack of consent. So any act depends if it's a rape or sexual coercion, but any act that lacks consent is a crime. And we are still not fully in compliance with the Istanbul Convention. So regarding laws, we still demand that there is violence, serious uh, threats, mm -hmm. or constraining someone. And it's a higher standard than focusing just on the lack of consent. And in here, I think we are still a bit afraid of focusing uh, all the discussion on the lack of consent, because then We've all heard uh, the um, argument of, but then what can we do? Uh, when can we be accused of raping someone? So it's very important also to have a definition and to understand that there is no stagnant definition of consent. It needs to be assessed according to the situation, the circumstances, uh, if the person was drinking or not, mm -hmm. and also, if there is a safe space, because I think there is a lot of, I would say lack of information, but also lack of empathy. But probably lack of information too. Yes. We don't talk about, it. in Portugal, I, I think we don't talk much about this. And still we have, uh, we had the news from yesterday, 22 women murdered just this year, and we are not in the end of the year. Yes. This should not make us proud, it should make us, very, very worried. Yes, we are still in a very, in Portugal, a very patriarchal society, yeah. and we still hold on to gender norms that perpetuate uh, rape myths, such as she was asking for it, uh, and also these basic ideas that, in general, I'm speaking about women and men because it's the majority of the statistics, mm -hmm. but it's not absolute, but that, um, women are more submissive, and specifically in cases of intimate relationships, that women owe this to their partners in heterosexual relationships mm -hmm. mostly. They owe something to their partners. Um, but just to end what I was saying, and I am very passionate. self-esteem. Yes. 
Um, and that's where we have to work. But we are going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, to just see and a few this um, a few minutes, yeah. part is that we cannot give consent if we are not in a safe space. Yeah. If we, d if the human body feels threatened, in danger, we are in survival mode, yeah. activating our fight or flight responses. And often, we, if we don't say no, if we don't scream, if we don't physically resist, doesn't mean that we were not raped or uh, abused because the human body shuts down. Yeah, and our head too. And our heads too. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also really important. Yeah, Monica, you are a part of this amazing project in uh, the UK. Uh, how can, what can you tell us about consent and this project too? So consent is really about respect. Yeah. It's a fundamental part of every interaction we have, sexual or non-sexual. And often when we're talking to the young people in our schools, we make it really clear that they actually already know how to recognize it, how to understand it, how to ask for it, how to give it and withhold it. And did they know? And they know because actually the examples we use are everyday examples. I know how to ask my friend, can I have some chips off your plate? <laughs> right? I know how to say, no, I don't want you to eat my chips, either through words, if I'm really comfortable and confident mm -hmm. saying no, or through the way I behave. I pull my plate close to me and I put my arm around it. You can't have my chips. So they understand it in that context, but when we put things into an intimate, romantic, sexual situation, for adults too, all of these basic instincts we have fall out of our heads. And so it's really important that we focus on consent as being simple as a concept, in the um, complexities of relationships. But fundamentally, it's simple. It's straightforward. This is what consent is. We use the law as a baseline, okay? It's a baseline. It tells us, do not cross this line because that is a criminal act. But it mm -hmm. is only a baseline. We want to do far better. We want to reach much higher in terms of setting standards. So consent isn't simply about obeying a law. It is about wanting, expecting, and giving a fully enthusiastic, active, informed yes, whether through words or through actions. And we have to start in schools with younger people. You say here in this documentary that education is the answer. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is it really the answer? Absolutely. I think education is the answer to almost everything. Almost everything, yeah. Right? Pretty sure. Um, we learn best in moments outside of crisis. Mm. So when we find ourselves in a moment of crisis, we're reactive. Understandably, that's a human reaction. If we start in schools with young people, we stand a much better chance, first of all, of changing society's attitudes, because this is a societal problem. Um, and young people learn, we, we all learn in really simple, straightforward ways. We learn by, first of all, someone tells us how to do something. My mum told me to cross a road. I must look both ways a couple yeah. of times. I must listen. And then we're shown how to do it. So we're modeled this idea. So she holds my hand. She looks both ways. And I observe and I learn. But ultimately, the message will sit with me when I do it myself. So eventually, she lets go of my hand or she sends me out. I stand at that road and all the things I've been taught, they become embedded once I do it myself. So we have to build on that. And with young people, they genuinely want to learn. Um, that is my experience of them. A lot of the information they've had, which they may not have understood was, was not actually accurate. Unless we tell them that, mm -hmm. they're not going to know any different. Okay. Mafalda, um, people learn by example, right? So we have to have these uh, education programs at schools. We have to have this play. We have to have this documentary. But first of all, we have to be the role model. 
young girls look at us, mothers, sisters, cousins, just like the way they want to be. So we are the first model. Absolutely. I think, um, I think if we start, as Monica was saying, by teaching young people, obviously that includes our young girls. Yeah. So we will teach them how to value themselves because it's also very important to feel empowered to also say no because we know most of the time we might say yes or not be very vocal about things because we're not confident. We don't feel empowered to do that. And I think, especially because, I, because of the process of doing the documentary, I was lucky enough to go see the workshops. Yes. And they do empower. And just being in a room with Monica, Kate, Jotty, it was very empowering because yes, law is the baseline, but if I know my rights, it does give me confidence. So I think, I don't have children yet, but one day if I do, I feel like I will be confident enough to pass on that confidence. So teaching our young girls about confidence in themselves, I think it'll go a long, long way for consent to be But also, normal. like we heard on this documentary, we have to teach adults. Absolutely. Which because is why we're all here. Yeah, because some adults don't know how to do Absolutely. this. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, I don't know if I can speak for all three of us, but when I was younger, even though I come from a very um, positive, reinforcing background, my family, my friends, no one ever sat down with me and talked to me about consent. You can say no, yeah. Yeah, no one told, no one, you, you no one told no. me that. Yeah. yeah, no one told me, okay, so this is consent and this isn't that, blah, blah, blah. No. Uh, and I think if we start those conversations, and even by doing the documentary, talking to my friends, everyone is like, oh, that's so interesting. Oh, SCP's work is so important. I wish I had that in school. Yeah. So that's the feedback that I've been given. And I think that shows how important it is to teach people uh, about consent. Yeah. Carolina, we just have a few minutes to finish, but uh, just to talk to all of you. Um, just like I said at the beginning, art can be um, in, in uh, um, can play a very important role for the community. Can give the example for the community. We have this documentary, the 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 play. What can we do more? What can we arrange together to make it more positive and more uh, constant? While I was listening to this uh, last question and I was just boiling yeah. because I'm a very active feminist, <laughs> very passionate feminist, and what we can do more is, of course, education, but in the sense, so we, well, I am speaking about Portugal, but everywhere. There is no country in the world where there is gender equality. And this is the root of the problem. If, yes, we do not know uh, how to educate youngsters about consent because we still do not know what it means. Yep. We, especially women, grow up with the idea um, that our bodies are not entirely our own. They are exposed to touch, to catcalling. Our body is a temple. Not everyone thinks that way. And it's not our fault, really. Yeah. What we can do, uh, I, I wouldn't put this in the hands of women, although focusing on this concept of consent is very empowering because in it by itself really shows, okay, then I can just have the right to my own body and to educate also uh, adults in the root cause of gender equality and to start looking at women as equal human beings and not always inferior, I think it's part of the solution and it will change everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just uh, at the la in the last minute, so I want to ask, we have a lot of more things to talk about this, of course. We have an entire day to talk about this, but I want to ask you a final message. Um, to the young girls, to the girls, to the women that um, are thinking about this, are listening to us and uh, think about consent, think that they wanted to say no. We, have, we must have sympathy for them. 
but we also must empower them. Can we start, Mufan? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think uh, young girls should know that it's okay to say no, and it's okay to say it in a body language way as well. It doesn't always need to be verbal, and hopefully we are now providing a safe space for them. So that's my hope with this. Carolina. Well, for me, I would say that it is very hard for girls growing up uh, to impose themselves, but that if you feel pressure to do something, just walk away because that's not the right path. Yeah, that's not your thing. That's not where you yeah. should go. And yeah. I'm not saying it's an individual responsibility of every man, of course not. It's a, a systemic Same. problem, yeah. but also that um, your body is just your body, and also do not put yourself in the submissive parts because we speak about men's sexuality and needs, but we don't do it for women, and women also have them. They just need to be respected and equally seen. Monica, please. I would say talk. Talk to each other, talk to others, and I would also say talk to yourself because the relationship, the one relationship in our lives that lasts for the whole of our lives from start to end is the one we have with ourselves. And so it's really important to know yourself before you make decisions and be really comfortable about what you want and don't want so that you can be comfortable saying those things. Yes. Thank you, Monica, Carolina, and Mafalda for being here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my final message is that uh, victims are uh, never responsible for violence, for sexual violence, just like we heard on the documentary. And don't forget that you don't need to give your body to have food, to have a job, and to have respect. Thank you so much. Thank you.